Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the UFC Fight Night card for this uh, Saturday, January 12th. We had a nice three-week uh, hiatus from MMA, and we're ready to start off the new year with uh, the first card of the year. For those of you joining us for the first time, um, these are a series of three videos uh, that we do for, that I do for each UFC card. And it's broken down into three parts, well, three separate videos. First one is usually today uh, on Thursdays where we go over the best DFS plays. Um, and, you know, we go through the odds, we go through the props and all that stuff and tell you who the best DFS plays are. Um, the second video on Friday is when we do the MMA contrarian betting breakdown, which is um, usually really, really fun. You know, we, we, we focus in on who the public likes, where the narratives are driven, and try to fade it. And that's a, a very fun way to approach UFC wagering. And it's a very useful way to train your mind to um, to think about betting markets in, in a contrarian, kind of a sharper way. And then um, on either later Friday or early Saturday, we do the second part of the DFS breakdown, which is exclusively lineup built. And I feel it's extremely important to separate those two pieces, the uh, the picks, of the the, you know, the plays, and lineup construction, because uh, well, in all sports DFS, but uh, specifically in MMA, there's such a difference between knowing who the best plays are and knowing how to actually construct lineups that are tailored to the types of contests that you're playing. So we're going to do a, a, a specific video just for that for all of the cards, and we're going to use saber sim, we're going to do contest sims, we're going to go through little tricks and techniques to get different and things like that. And also we'll have a better idea of ownership as well. And we'll, uh, I, I listen so far, people have really enjoyed this format and uh, we're going to keep doing it. So today we're just going to go over what, you know, I think are the best plays DFS wise. And I hate to dismiss this, but this is, this is really the easy part of playing UFC DFS is, is, is figuring out who the best plays are and who the good plays are and who the bad plays are. To figure out which which of them to actually play is a completely separate question. And to figure out who to play with who with who else in your lineup is a better question indeed. And, and then figuring out which lineups to operate together to make a portfolio of lineups for an M for a, a, a multi-entry contest, that's another thing. So uh that that's uh kind of the intro and summary of where we're going but let's just start we'll go through uh fight by fight and figure out what we need and again what you're looking for in dfs are fighters with a good inside the distance prop um and in the absence of that we want uh, we want fighters that have high grappling upside and uh those two things usually contribute to high scores you can also get there by you know, high volume decisions, but that's usually very, very rare. You're usually going to get the big scores from either knocking the person out or submitting them early uh, or getting a whole bunch of takedowns and control time. All right, so let's go through this. So Joshua Van against um, Bunes. First thing we look at is the money line, make sure there's no issues here. So we have Van at 8,800, which I would imagine would correlate to about him being about a two to one favorite on a card like this. Let's take a look. Um, yeah, he's minus two fifty. I mean, that's really, really, that that's, it's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good DraftKings price for this type of money line. And the reason why is you get that is there are just other fighters that are just have just bigger money lines and they have this, this band of salaries they have to put guys between. They really don't go up a, above 96, 9,700. So all these favorites between, you know, 87 and 95, 600, they don't give anybody the same salary. So that's why sometimes you'll see a minus 200 favorite be 8,600. Sometimes you'll see a minus 200 favorite be 9,400. In this case, you have a minus 250 favorite at 8,800, which is very, very reasonable. Now, as far as him being a good DFS play, again, we have to ask ourselves, does he have a lot of take that upside? And if not, um, we have to make sure his inside the distance prop is strong. So Josh Drew Van is pretty much a striker. So he's not going to really have the takedown upside. Um, so we have to see if his inside the distance prop is strong enough. So we're looking at best fight odds. 
according to best find odds, you have is inside the distance line is somewhere around plus 160. Um, that accounts for VIG. It accounts for uh, both sides of the line. Uh, so plus 160 for an $8,800 fighter is okay. Um, when you get around 9K, you really want to have an inside the distance prop of about pick them. But this is not bad. Um, and when you also consider that he does have a great deal of volume, I mentioned earlier that volume alone usually doesn't do the trick, but when you combine that with also this okay inside the distance line, I do think the Joshua Man is a very reasonable mid-range favorite here. Now, Bunez on the other side, um, when you're dealing with underdogs, it's the same type of thing. Like you, you, you want guys with upside, okay? And how much upside you need really depends on the, the size of the slate. So like right now, it's a 12-fight card, which is kind of a, you know, very healthy size, but not overwhelmingly healthy. You know, I've seen 13, 14-fight cards, but at least it's not an 11- or 10-fight card. And when you have a 12-fight card, you really do want to prioritize the underdogs that have upside, especially for the, you know, for the big GPPs, which is what we like to play. Um, so... When you have Brunez here, you know, his, his money line is not great. So he's not going to get there just on money line. What we need is for him to either have a great deal of wrestling upside or um, or uh, a good inside the distance prop. Now, again, good for his price doesn't require much. Like even if he's like plus 300 or even plus 320, I think he's reasonable. Let's take a look at this. So Brunez inside the distance is... I mean, it's about plus 300. I think that's reasonable, you know? So uh, plus 300 at his price, which is 7,400. I think it's pretty reasonable. And uh, I heard it said that Brunez might have some takedown upside as well. Now, again, you have these other issues like he's 34 and all this stuff and having a, making the 34-year-old making his debut is no, is no bargain. Um, and you can hear all the rumblings that this is kind of not a fixed fight, but a setup fight for, for, for Joshua Van. Um, well, I shouldn't say a setup fight because Joshua Van is actually coming in a little bit. Uh, he's the one coming in on short notice, right? Um, Cause Brunez was actually supposed to fight already, but Joshua Van's 22 and I don't imagine they give him a fight that they plan on him losing. So uh, it is tough to play Brunez, but the inside the distance line is what it is, and it's not bad. So I do think that both sides of this fight are playable. All right, uh, Tom Nolan versus Nicholas Mota. So you have a 9,207K fight here. And again, that could correlate to a, a money line of anywhere between minus 230 and minus like 500, depending on the other context of the slate. So you do have Joshua Van, as we just mentioned, was 8,800 minus 250. I imagine that Nolan would be significantly would be a little bit higher, but this is quite a bit higher. So Nolan is minus three forty, um, and you're only paying an extra what? Uh, well, you're paying four hundred more. I guess that's pretty reasonable. I guess when you compare his money line to that of a Van, I think it's very very similar. Now, with respect to the inside the distance lines, um, again, when you're ninety two hundred, you need to have better than you know, 8,800. I mean, you need to have an inside the distance line of at least minus 110, um, hopefully more. And in the absence of that, you need a lot of takedown upside. So let's take a look and see. And you do have like an extremely strong inside the distance line here. You have no one inside the distance, like minus 220, maybe. That's just enormous, you know? So this is a pretty elite play here. Um, I would say that he's much better, even given the price, than Van. Now, we're not talking about ownership yet. That's going to be for lineup break, you know, for the second part of the videos. But no one, it looks like an extremely strong play. Now, with respect to Moda, Moda's a, a big, big underdog. So he's got to have, you know, a really strong inside the distance line. Like, once again, we're looking at, like, plus 300-ish. And actually... It's not bad. You know, Moda is plus 320 here when you account for VIG. And for his price, 
that's pretty freaking reasonable. Um, and not to get too much into lineup construction here, but you know, if no one is projecting to be such a great play because of a strong inside the distance line, I do imagine that he's going to be pretty popular. So one of the things that Moda has going for him is that, you know, not only does his inside the distance line good, pretty good on its own, but he's also getting leverage against what's going to be a probably a very popular fighter. So that, you know, moves Moda up, you know, uh, I would say, I would say clearly above Bunes because they have a very similar inside the distance line, but his opponent is going to be more popular. I mean, it's pretty clear that no one's going to be more popular than Van given those, given those metrics. So I think Moda, by definition, is going to be probably a better bit of leverage than Boone is. So I think, again, both sides of this fight, very, very strong. Um, and we're kind of just off to the races. Um, all right, next fight, another big, big favorite. But now we have a $9,600 fighter. So we have Gene Silva against Weston Wilson. So I'm imagining he's like minus 800. But let's just see. Um, Gene Wilson, Gene Silva, sorry, he's minus like a thousand. So the money line is there, but for a $9,600 fighter, I mean, you've got to, it's not even enough to have a good inside the distance line at 9,600. You've got to have a good like round one prop or a strong inside the distance line plus uh, a, a lot of takedowns. So Gene Silva does not, this, you know, he doesn't really have the takedown upside. We're just betting on him with his KO prop. So what do we need for him to get there at 9,600? I would say, you know, minus 300 inside the distance would be nice. And like minus 110 round one. I think that's, I think that's a reasonable ask. So let's take a look. Well, Wilson inside the distance is, well, not Wilson inside the distance. Silva inside the distance minus 600. That's kind of obscene. Um, so that's plenty. And let's see round one, though. Silva round one minus 150. I mean, that's pretty darn good. So he's a very, very strong play. Um, if you can get to him, and that's for lineup construction, you know, we'll deal with that. But he certainly has the metrics to pay off his price tag. Uh, Wilson inside the distance is just, you know, just doesn't exist like plus a thousand. This is not going to be good enough. Um, so here it's going to be either favorite or nothing. All right. Um, so let's just put him in. So we don't forget. Fareed Basharat versus Taylor Lapilus. So we have an 8,900 versus 7,300 fight. And on the surface, it seems similar to Van Bunez because the money lines are very similar. Let's take a look. Um, Fareed Basharat is, again, he's about minus 300, 280, pretty similar to Joshua Van. But the difference is, is that Basharat really is not going to have the same type of inside the distance line. Like when we look at it, Basharat inside is going to be like plus 240. And that's just really not good enough. The The thing is, though, is that it's possible that Basharat has a, quite a bit of takedown upside. Now, we go into his game log to do a uh, respite log to see that. And he had two takedowns in his last fight and three takedowns in his fight before that. So um, if, in fact, he does go for takedowns, and if, in fact, he does get them, and if, in fact, he does get that control time, uh, then he could pay off 8,900. Um, but we, you have to know that he's going to do that. And we don't have that big of a sample size from him to be sure that he's going to be going for that, you know, that form of, uh, of, of approach. Um, Lapalus, from what I hear, is very, very slow. Um, he, you know, fights a, a slow pace is what I mean whole bunch of decisions, things like that. Um, he has a couple of, couple of KOs, which is interesting, but this back like 2015, 16, he took like seven years off. Then he had a, what is this? A very boring striking based decision. So it's possible that 
Basharat does go for those takedowns, gets them, and and pays off. Is he a better price? Is he a better play than Van? Um, because they are very similar. I think I think he might be. Uh, you know, I do think it's very close, you know, because it, it seems to be the case that he's going to be going for these takedowns. And if he does get them, I mean, he really does have a 120-point upside in that variation. Um, so I think they're equal. I'm going to say Basharat and Van are probably pretty equal. Now, as far as Lapalus goes, um, let's see what his inside the distance line. I mean, it's really, really poor. And he also doesn't have wrestling. So all this is a way of saying that he's a very poor underdog. So here, again, it's going to be favorite or pets in DFS. All right, Marcus McGee versus, uh, who's this? Gaston Bolanos. So 9,100, 7,100. Here's another one in the same type of range. We're expecting to see about minus 300 or so. Let's take a look. Marcus McGee is actually, his win odds are a little bit poor for this price. I mean, he's only minus 210, 230, maybe 240. He's, he's a... He's a He's got the same win odds, maybe even a little worse than Van, who is 400 points lower. So uh, $400 uh, dollars lower in salary. So McGee has actually some negative line value here. So for him to be a good play, he's got to really make up for it in, uh, in his inside the distance line. And at 9,100, he's going to need to have an inside the distance line of about minus 110. We take a look at this and ooh, he just gets there. Okay, so not bad. So McGee inside the distance, minus 115 or so. So he is good enough. Doesn't exactly have that much takedown upside. But he does bring a high pace. Could have good volume to go with his inside the distance line. So I think it's, I think he's a fair price. You know, his his money line's not great. Uh, but his inside the distance line makes up for it. So I think he's a fine play. And what about Gaston Bolanos here? So he, look, if, if, if McGee has bad money line value, then by definition, Bolanos has good money line value. So I think he's probably a decent money line play, but I'd love for him to get boosted by a little bit of inside the distance big. So let's see what he is. Oh, Bolanos inside the distance is plus 380 or something. It's just, I just don't think it's quite good enough. And the problem is that with McGee, with the negative line value, I don't I don't know if he's going to be as popular as we need to play an underdog for leverage. So I'm going to you know, listen. Bolanos is going to show up in my big MME builds, but I don't think I'm going to prioritize him as one of my favorite underdogs. And McGee, again, I think is fine. So, again, McGee, decent favorite. Uh, Bolanos, probably fringy at best underdog. Um. All right, Matthew Semmelsberger versus Preston Parsons. We have basically a pick'em fight. Uh, Semmelsberger, more like minus 130 or so. So we expect him to be maybe about 8,300 as far as DraftKings go. He's 8,400. That's fair enough. And this fight is probably one of the three fights you want to target here, both sides. I'm just imagining both inside the distance lines are going to be strong. Preston's Parsons, he's a pressure fighter. He can take you down. Semmelsberger can have, take you down too. He gets knockdowns also. This, this is going to be a lot, you know, all action fight. And when you look at the inside of distance lines, I mean, Semmelsberger plus 160, Parsons plus 200. So Parsons is a little worse, but not that much worse. Uh, given his price, I think he's just the same as, as Semmelsberger. And I think they're both very, very strong. So here you could play both sides of this and, and you certainly are now going to be including Parsons in your, uh, in your underdog pool. So again, we're, we're just kind of keeping track here, you know, of the underdogs that we kind of like Parsons, more mid range Moda, maybe, maybe some uh, Brunes, uh, Brunes. Um, but so far it's, 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 Parsons, Moda, and Brunes. And Bolanos is really on the outside of it. But this is definitely a fight that you want to probably go after. Both these money lines are pretty strong for their prices. And 
uh, it does rate to be a high paced fight as well. Um, which way are we going here? Oh, we're going to go here. Um, Waldez Acosta, Cortez Acosta, 9,500 versus 6,700. So that's going to be, I'm sure he's minus 700 or something like that. Yep, he's minus 700. And for that price, again, he doesn't have any takedowns. So he's going to need, uh, you know, it's not even enough to have an inside the distance line of minus 110. He's got to have a, not only an inside the distance line of minus 300 or so, but again, I'd like him to have minus 110 first round. So that would probably bring him on on pace or on par with uh, with Silva, for example. So let's take a look. Cotes, of course, Acosta, inside the distance is minus, you know, 180, which is pretty strong. Let's look at it by, K, by round one. Acosta round one is actually plus 220. So Acosta, it looks like a, definitely a worse play than West, than, uh, than Silva. We'll remind ourselves, Silva round one is like minus 120. This is a much better play. So if you had to pick between these two uh, high price fighters, I think that Acosta would be worse. I mean, he'd definitely be worse. And Arlovsky, unfortunately, I mean, he, you know, he just doesn't win the fight often enough. You know, he's plus 500. I, I presume that's probably what his inside the distance line is as well, but maybe even not. His inside the distance line is like plus 1,000. So, you know, even even though it's a lot of, might, you might get some leverage, uh, you just can't play him. All right, here we have all action fight number two, which is Bruno Ferreira versus Phil Hawes, 8,300 versus 7,900. And first, let's double check the money line here, make sure there wasn't any big Ferreira action. Um, there was some, but not much. So he's minus 130. So the, it's well in line with what the price is here uh, 83 versus 79. And 83, 7,900. You need inside the distance lines of about plus 200, like we saw in Semmelsberger, uh, the Semmelsberger fight. And you're definitely getting this. So you have Ferreira inside the distance of minus 110. I mean, remember, compare that to McGee. Like McGee is the same inside the distance line and is 9,100, where Ferreira is 8,300 with the, with the minus 120. And then you have Hawes inside the distance is plus 160. Plus, he's got some takedown upside. So this fight, I mean, I think you're almost forced to play one of these two. Um, and if you play multiple lineups, I would really I would really get 100% of this fight. I don't know how this fight doesn't deliver. So according to the metrics, at least. So uh, when we get to contrarian betting, maybe we'll do something a little funky. But as far as DFS goes, we're going to trust the money line. Uh, we're going to trust the inside the distance line and probably just get both sides of this. So again, to keep track, you know, we have another underdog that's making our pool here. Um, we have Bruno Ferreira here. So, uh, excuse me, we'll have Hawes making our player pool as a another kind of decent underdog here. Now you see, like these three underdogs, you play them, then you can play three ninety-one hour fighters. Like for example. Um, Okay, moving along, we have Mario Batista versus Ricky Simone. All right, so this is a interesting fight here. Um, we'll say let's take a look at the money line first. So Ricky Simone is minus one eighty five. So I'm expecting, in the context of the slate, for him to be at eighty six hundred, which he is eighty six hundred. Now I'm not expecting the inside the distance line to be the deal here. What, what's we'll take a look at it, but Simone, Simone inside the distance is plus three hundred, which Usually, what you that's what you want for like a seventy two hundred dollar fighter, not eighty six. And Batista inside the distance is plus like four hundred. But the thing is, is that this fight does rate to be a grappling fight. So there's there's grappling points up for sale in this fight. Um, from what I'm hearing, I mean, from what I'm hearing, it is going to be a tough fight for Batista. You know, because. Batista is sort of a grappler, but Simone is just better. So this, this could this fight could play out a couple of ways. 
sometimes when you have wrestler versus wrestler, grappler versus grappler, the defense kind of takes over and, and it ends up being kind of a striking battle. But the other way this could, could um, develop is you have two wrestlers or two grapplers, but one is just like better than the other one. And the other fighter just gets overwhelmed. And I think that this is a fight that's very possible um, on the Simone side. So uh, even though Simone's uh, inside the distance line is good, his takedown upside is so strong uh, that he's got to be considered a very, very strong play. So Simone, very, very strong. I I just don't see any anything for Batista to justify him being as a good underdog. You know, he, the exception of the fact that Simone might be popular, um, his inside the distance line is poor, and he doesn't rate to get the best of the of the grappling exchanges. You know, if if I think that if he wins, it might end up being just he might get the better of the striking. It's possible, um, but I do think that this this fight is Simone or nothing. All right, uh, Gabriel Benitez versus Jim Miller, eighty two hundred eight k. So we're expecting Jim Miller to be about a small favorite, and unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, unfortunately, he's not. I mean, he's like a full minus one forty. All the money's come in on him. So we're probably looking at an extremely popular play here. Um, again, this is we're not really getting into lineup construction, but he's going to be a really strong looking play for a lot of reasons. Number one, like I said, the inside the disc, excuse me, the money line is just it's just great. I mean, he's minus 140, he's only 8,200. In addition to that, when you look at the inside the distance line, you have Miller inside the distance plus 150. I mean, that's, it's not, well, it's not quite as good as Ferreira though. Like Ferreira inside the distance at the same price pretty much was minus 120. Okay, so just based on inside the distance line, Miller is a little worse than Ferreira. But when I think when you throw in the, well, let's put it another way. When you throw in the money line movement, I guess that Miller's the better play, but but are we really playing Miller because of his decision equity? I mean, probably not. So we really should just be looking at the inside the distance line. So um, Miller, I mean, listen, it does look like an incredible play, but I would say that Pereira is a little bit better. So uh, nonetheless, I mean, Miller at th those metrics, very, very strong. Um, and let's look at the other side of this for a minute. Now, again, Benitez, look, the money line sucks, right? At, at this price, he should be he should be lower. But again, forget that for a second. Let's take a look at just the inside the distance line. Benitez inside the distance is plus 200. And if all we knew was that you were getting a 70, you know, 8K fighter with a plus 200 inside the distance line, I think you'd want to consider that. And, and like we go back to Preston Parsons, for example, same type of thing and his inside the distance line is very similar so so i think that benitez looks to be a very similar play to parsons but because the money line dig is so strong on miller i think benitez you're going to get a good amount of leverage against miller here so i do think that both of these fighters are really really strong so what, what we've been seeing here so far is a lot of a lot of action from these mid-range fights um which is, which is fun because you, know, you have to make decisions here. I mean, you want to play these mid-range fights. So if you do that, you probably don't get to play the the, uh, the, the Gene Silvas or the West, uh, the, the Waldo Acosta, uh, Acosta or Tom Nolan, all of them being good plays. All right. Uh, last two fights, we have Manel uh, Kopp versus Mateus Nicolau. So we have... Top is 9K, Mikola 7,200. So again, probably a minus 300 or something like that. And that's pretty much what we're getting here. So again, for Manel Kopp to be a good play, though, at 99K, we want an inside the distance line of about minus 110. We don't really have a lot of takedown upside from him. Let's take a look. Kopp inside the distance is not really good at him. He's plus 160. So he's just going to just 
I don't want to say fall off, but certainly go down the list. I mean, he's the same play as – he's got the same metrics as Joshua Van, but he's 200 more, like for example. Um, I mean, he's got the same – he's got a worse inside the distance line than any of these mid-range guys that we talked about, like Ferreira or, um, or you know, whoever the winner of the – excuse me, whoever the winner of the Hawes fight is. Whoever the winner of this, not the Semmelsberg fight, he's a little bit better than that, but whoever the winner of the Miller fight is, maybe, you know? So, um, Cop is probably on the outside looking in. I mean, if you're going to play him in 91, you may as well get up to, I mean, McGee, right? Like, McGee, he's minus 110 at the same price. So, uh, I don't think that Cop is going to be a priority, if, if even playable, honestly. And Mateus Nicolau, I mean, his inside the distance line is not only poor, but he also, you know, look at that, plus 110, uh, plus 1,000. But as I mentioned, you know, Cop's metrics don't look that great, so you're also not getting a lot of leverage So, um, because Cop won't be that highly owned. So I think this fight is close to a fade, actually. And then we get to the main event, which is always going to be played. Um, they're both probably going to be somewhat popular, as they always are. Well, let's just take a look at it. So you have... I think Galab is minus 500. Let's take a look at the money line, 9,400. Yeah, pretty reasonable given the context of the slate and all that. And for 9,400, you know, in a five round fight, what you need is probably a combination of a, a either a really super strong inside the distance line, a good round one prop, or some takedowns to go along with your inside the distance line. And like it or not, I mean, he's going to look pretty good, you know, because you have his inside the distance line is, you know, first of all, minus one, minus 200, which is really good. But remember, just because you have a good inside the distance line doesn't mean that he's great because, again, he's got five rounds to, to cover that inside the distance line. And if, in fact, he finishes them him in round three or round four, he probably – Maybe probably doesn't pay off 9,500. We look at round one. I bet you it's extremely poor. Uh, round one is actually, well, boy, plus 200. It's not bad. I was expecting, I wasn't expecting that. But the thing is, is that Ankalaev also has some wrestling to go to. So when you have combined all of that, like the five rounds with the wrestling, with the inside the distance line, with the money line, I mean, he's a solid play. Um, I, I, I wonder if it's worth eating all the ownership to play him, uh, that's going to be more for um, for the lineup build. But as far as the metrics go, I mean, it's certainly a really, really strong play. And, and, and Walker, we'll take a look at this. Um, his He doesn't win the fight a lot. I mean, he only wins the fight 20% of the time. But Walker inside the distance plus 600. Oh, goodness. You know, I, I want to play him. I mean, I really do. The metrics are certainly not supported. You know, he has no takedowns. His inside the distance line stinks. The only thing I would say is that because Ankalaev is going to look really good, he's going to be really popular. So if Walker does win, you're going to get a bunch of leverage. But I don't think that Walker is going to be like no, no percent owned. You know, you got five rounds to work with your volume alone is going to have you show up in, in projection models, you know? So it's probably going to end up being at least 15%. So it's not as if you're getting a huge ownership break, um, but you are getting some leverage. So I, I, I think I prefer the other underdogs better. Um, but Walker's like fine. So, so basically the idea is this main event, I think both plays are fine. It's kind of inclined to not play them. Though. Uh, not, I mean, in 150, I'm going to play them obviously, but I think I prefer to fade it uh, or at least go under on it. That would, that would be my, my, uh, my take. So that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, we, we could summarize, um, but a lot of good mid range options. You know, you have the, the um, Semmelsberger-Parsons fight, the Hawes-Pereira fight. 
uh, and the Miller Benitez fight. Those are the keys, I think. And then there are a couple of punts. You know, uh, you could have play Mota, very reasonable punt. Brunez, uh, kind of okay. Um, Bolanos, maybe. You know, and then, and then these favorites are all right. You know, Basharat, McGee. I mean, I, I don't think there's any favorite that I re really didn't like. I mean, Hop, I guess, would be my least favorite. Um, Simone's a good mid-range play. I think Costa is worse than Gene Silva, if that helps you. Um, but all this is really going to come down to, to lineup construction, which we will get to on Saturday. And we're going to have some fun because we are going to really just focus on that 150, uh, that 150 max uh, tournament. And we're going to try to mix, you know, different strategies of getting unique and also playing these, the, you know, the good plays. Until then, uh, this, well, actually not until then, this week, it's going to be a betting breakdown tomorrow as well. But until then, I guess, this is Sheets and good luck.